Welcome to Radio OPAC. Radio OPAC is a division of Ohio Prison Arts Connection. OPAC connects people to the arts inside and outside of prison. My name is Catherine Roma and I will be your host today. We want to welcome all of you, all of our friends in correctional institutions in Ohio and other states via our DVDs of the shows. The shows are also archived on YouTube. Our guest today is Emily Steinmetz, Professor of Anthropology at Washington College in Maryland. Please join me in welcoming her to Radio OPAC. Emily, gosh, uh, <laughs> it's so great to be with you. Um, and I wanna tell our listening and viewing audience that I, I don't know when we met, maybe 2015, um, and it all had to do with our work at Dayton Correctional Institution in Dayton, Ohio, uh, a women's uh, prison. And um, so I wonder if you would start perhaps by talking about a project that you are doing right now, even as you are in Maryland, um, with some of the women lifers at DCI. Yeah, well, thank you, Kathy, for um, inviting me to be part of this. I'm excited to be here today um, and honored that I was invited to, to talk with you. Um, so I've uh, I lived in Ohio from 2014 through 2018 and was a professor at that time at Antioch College, um, which is how uh, and that, it's during that period that I came to be involved at Dayton Correctional Institution. Um, and I had a lot of very energetic and enthusiastic students who also um, really helped to build a lot of the projects that we're gonna talk about today um, while I was a professor at Antioch. Um, but one of the things that I've continued to work on uh, since leaving Ohio and coming to Maryland is a project with women who are serving life sentences at Dayton. Um, and there are actually a few, a few pieces to that project, um, but the one that I think is the most um, the most exciting is really um, a book project uh, that involves me and uh, several uh, women, uh, eight or nine women, who are all kind of writing uh, things about the experience of serving life sentences. And then um, I'm kind of writing pieces about um, that kind of form a, the backbone of the book about life sentencing um, policies uh, and um, my own kind of intellectual and academic understanding of life sentencing and so it's kind of weaving together um, lots of different kinds of knowledge about life sentencing from academic to personal experience wow so did you have you done some um specific projects artistic projects um that you could speak about in relation to what you've already told us about yeah, uh, so this project actually builds on work that we had been doing um, starting in 2017 uh, with with people serving life sentences. Um, when I was at Antioch, we participated in a national uh, traveling exhibition called States of Incarceration. Um, and uh, basically, the it was run through the Humanities Action Lab, which is based at Rutgers University. And the States of Incarceration project basically invited different colleges and universities to contribute pieces to the exhibit. Um, and when they did that, they had to be in dialogue with community partners. Um, and whatever that contribution was, they had to look at a unique aspect of imprisonment in the United States. Um, and so when we started to get involved, we realized that there was no piece of that exhibit that existed yet that explored life sentencing. And so we thought that was a really important contribution. Um, and so a group of students in a class I was teaching and a group of women at Dayton Correctional who were serving life sentences, um, as well as Forrest Bright, who's a professor of, of art at Antioch College and lots of other people actually all kind of worked together to put this exhibit, art piece of the exhibit uh, together. And then we hosted it at Antioch College. Um, while we hosted it, we also had to host a series of community dialogues about um, imprisonment and ours mostly focused on life sentencing um, and, and some of the things related to that. So we hosted a film screening about aging and hospice care in prisons. 
um, Jennifer Berman at Antioch College um, pulled together a restorative justice symposium that really dovetailed with our hosting of this exhibit. Uh, we had community dialogues about parole and parole reform in Ohio. So we had lots of conversations about these different dimensions of life sentencing. Um, so when that project was completed um, uh, and we finished hosting it on campus, um, I continued to work with this group of women who participated in the, in the uh, Humanities Action Lab exhibit and Forrest Bright, who's the artist. Um, and we started envisioning a book project. And then along the way, we also have published an essay, an illustrated essay um, about uh, walls and the many kinds of walls that thread through the women's lives um, as, they, as they serve life sentences. So each of them wrote a, a passage about the walls that they wanted to talk about and explore. And then I wrote kind of the main part of the essay with a lot of feedback and input from them. And Forrest uh, created some illustrations based on what all of us were writing. Wonderful. So we can see some of those things. Yes. Uh, those, those beautiful pictures. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, I wanted to say that, you know, the women who go into um, DCI are part of Hope Through Harmony, a women's choir mm -hmm. that's an inside-outside choir. And I do remember that the women who come in to DCI from the outside, we sang at the opening right. of um, the event that you're talking mm -hmm. about at Antioch College. It was, it was such an honor. It was such an amazing event. Oh, the exhibit opening was beautiful. There were lots of people who participated. We had some uh, Mary Evans and Amy Wisman were there who had been incarcerated at DCI and were returning citizens and they spoke at the event. And so the opening was really a kind of a beautiful um, expression of this expansive community of people, I think, who are all working together um, uh, on, I think, like changing the public's hearts and minds about imprisonment, but also kind of really still trying to connect and do meaningful work with people inside. Yeah. It was wonderful. Um, so I'd love you to share perhaps um, a little different way. Um, you started in a group called uh, Women Empowering Women. And I felt like I learned so much myself. I was tangentially involved with that and learned so much from the women. But, and, and it's carrying on uh, with Lori Askelin, but could you talk a little bit about how that emerged uh, whenever that was? Yeah, that was in 2015, um, and there were, it actually was started by you and a group of Antioch students, uh, so I'm not sure if you remember that all the way at its beginnings. Um, at the time, I was teaching an independent study to students. We didn't have any classes at the time about prisons, but I had a lot of students who were very interested in learning more, and so we put together an independent study. Uh, and I let the students all decide what kind of project they wanted to work on as their final project. And this group of students, there were four of them, worked together with you. You helped get them inside. Um, and it was just, uh, they started it as known as the reading and writing program. Yeah. Uh, and so they just asked this group of women inside who they who wanted to kind of gather and read and think and talk and write together what they wanted to to do and they took their ideas and they scoured the library and found interesting reading materials that they brought in and developed writing prompts and just created a beautiful community space and so that um, that happened for I, about two months I think and then uh, as we headed into summer they were like let's keep this running and we need some stability uh, as the students kind of rotate in and out of things uh, so I started kind of uh, organizing and spearheading the meetings, but always there were students heavily involved um, and we always tried to make it a collaborative community space. So the things that we did were really led by the interests of the incarcerated participants. Um, so yeah, um, there were zines, right? Uh, yeah. there were, I don't know, maybe four or five zines with their writings. It was so beautiful. And then I think you did a newspaper. What was that called? Uh, the newspaper was called The Symbolic Interruption, uh, and the title for the newspaper came from a book called Towards Psychologies of Liberation, which my Antioch students had been introduced to by Deanne Bell, who used to teach psychology at Antioch. 
Um, and it's a beautiful book about um, kind of blending traditions uh, like liberation theology and liberation psychology from Latin America um, and kind of bringing that to uh, to kind of a U.S. audience to help us think about um, oppression, how to interrupt oppression. And the idea of the symbolic interruption was really thinking about ways to interrupt systematic government um, oppression. And that's where the, um, the title from the newspaper came from. So that there were excerpts from that book that the Antioch students had brought into the prison that we read together, um, exploring this liberation psychology topic. Wow. That was, yeah, I think it's continuing. And of course, not during COVID, but mm -hmm. Lori Askelin um, is doing a beautiful job following in your footsteps. Um, everyone, in case you are just joining us, we are Radio OPAC. And my guest is Emily Steinmetz, Professor of Anthropology at Washington College in Maryland. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the books to prison project that is uh i think it's still going on at antioch college yes it was um again this was something else started by some students uh and uh a staff member uh and me all together that came out of one of those independent studies um and basically the idea was finding ways to get free books to people who were in prison and uh, the students started a book drive where they collected many donated books from people in the community. We had um, collected, we had a donation box at the public library. Um, people, as word spread, people were calling us and saying, I'm moving, I have boxes of books, can you come pick them up? Um, and uh, we also had access to a whole catalog of, of zines, which are just kind of homemade magazines uh, with lots of different topics and themes from how to be a jailhouse lawyer to things you can cook using commissary supplies to uh, how to work out when you're in prison. Um, and so we had these little catalogs we made um, that listed the zines and listed the kinds of books we had. And people could just write letters to us and ask for books. And we would do our best to kind of match, find things that met their interests and mail them to them. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of got that up and running. Uh, you know, there's challenges where a lot of prisons would send the packages back to us um, and say that we weren't allowed to send materials inside. Um, some will only accept packages from certified vendors like Amazon, but, but I think a lot of books still made it inside. Um, and that project has continued. I know uh, Louis Sabiri is helping to spearhead that at Antioch and some always, always energetic students helping to keep things like that running. Wonderful. Well, you know, um, I just always like to ask, you know, what is, um, there's never one thing, but if there was something you wanted to tell about your own transformation or something that moved and touched you um, beyond us being able to know, would you share something like that with us? Um, I think one of the biggest things that's impacted me is the, um, you know, something I've said to people before is if you actually go into a prison and sit and listen to people with an open mind and an open heart, I think you come to understand that the, how easily we could be in different places, that we could be in each other's shoes, that someone who I'm talking with could be in the position I'm in and how easily I could be in the position that they're in. Um, I think we set up a lot of uh, kind of barriers and walls to think that we have good and bad people and that we use prison walls to kind of separate good and bad people. But I think when you spend time inside of a prison, you realize how um, simplistic that idea is and how much more complicated um, everyone's situations are, that it's in fact sometimes luck or privilege or race or something else that um, helps us kind of, uh, or that 
um, leads us down the paths that we end up in. I mean, there are elements of individual choice, but that's just kind of one dimension of this complicated human experience. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, because that is, I can feel that exact same way. Um, I've had that exact same experience and you just put it into words so beautifully. Um, each week on Radio OPAC, we have a moment of reflection because we know these engaged arts projects and performances capture transformative experiences that lift our spirits and touch us in really powerful ways and they enliven our days. So do you, Emily, do you have something that you could share with us and with everyone who's listening and watching? And tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I do. I have um, uh, an excerpt from the Walls essay that we co-authored, uh, this group of women and I co-authored. And I think this essay is going to be made available as well if people want to read it in its entirety. Um, but kind of speaking to that last thing that I said, what, what's impacted me or how have I changed um, through these experiences, um, this passage that I'm going to read that I wrote, I think kind of speaks to that idea. Um, and this passage actually opens um, with a uh, kind of a nod to a man named Dwight Conkergood, who, um, who I actually knew. He passed away um, a, a while ago, but um, he was uh, kind of an amazing person, but did, he wrote this article about executions, about the death penalty as a ritual, a, a ritual performance. Um, and so this passage that I'm reading kind of opens with uh, an ac acknowledgement of his work and what I think is a really powerful message from, from his uh, insights. And it, it reads, In his analysis of executions as performance practice, Dwight Conkergood explores the crucial role of spectators in Puritan public hangings. Audience identification with the condemned as fellow sinners a sense of there but for the grace of God go I, was central to the ritual's efficacy. A Puritan ethos that embraced wrongdoers as members of the same moral community was superseded in the 19th century by a Gothic view of criminals as moral aliens and moral monsters. This marks a striking societal transformation away from collective and relational experiences of deviance toward a framework that a framework characterized by othering, revulsion, and contempt. Individualism and alienation are inscribed in modern, modern punishment rituals, the life sentence, the sanitized lethal injection. Today's prison walls materialize the shift. They offer a veneer of simplicity that homogenizes the diversity of people they can, they can find. People awaiting trial, people scooped up for public order offenses, people, people who have been wrongfully convicted, people serving time for nonviolent offenses, and people who have crossed borders seeking safety, as well as people who have caused violent harm. Yet regardless of their story, just by virtue of being on the other side of the wall, all prisoners occupy the status of dangerous criminal other. It becomes easy to turn them into scapegoats, to project onto them, the mostly white public's fears and anxieties. Um, and so something I, I, that from that passage that I think is important is this idea that we, um, that the way that we think about people who've caused harm or who've broken the law has changed really significantly over time. That there used to be a sense that that was all of us, that we were all good and bad, that we were all, we all held the potential to be sinners and that in fact, we probably all were. Um, but then what we started to see uh, more recently is a shift where we really kind of other people who, who we construct as deviant. Um, and that prisons are one way that we kind of inscribe that shift into um, the landscape, I guess, into the, the material world. Thank you so much. That's amazing. And I hope that uh, everyone will read that article, the full article, and see the artwork and see the wonderful contributions mm -hmm. by the women who you're working with inside yeah. of Dayton Correctional Institution in Dayton, Ohio. Emily, thank you so much for being with us um, and you know offering these wonderful 
perceptions, but also telling us about your experiences and what you're still doing um, in prison today. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're gonna make it happen. Do it today.